Okay, this is chapter three, uh, the first of, actually it says, yeah, three parts. And uh, this first part will cover cell structure, cell organelles, and let's get going. Before we get going, however, let's um, just point out that you can adjust this video. You can speed it up, even slow it down. There's a bar at the bottom of the screen. You could also stop it. You could watch it a second time. So uh, read these instructions and uh, use the video to your best um, your best capacity. Whatever you want to do with it, that helps you understand the material. All right, so the the first topic of this particular video lecture is an introduction to cells, that is cell structure, cell organelles. And we have quite a bit of material and some slides I'll pass over rather quickly. <coughs> um, that typically means if I skip something that it's not as important, but um, you know, use the lecture outline and what I say in this video lecture and what I say in, in class as your guide to the most important things to know. There will be material on these transparencies or, or I should say slides from chapter one that are, um, that are not from this textbook. So, uh, you know, use them to advantage. I've added them because they add material that I couldn't get from the slides that were here. All right, let's start. So the typical cell is the, the smallest living unit in the body. Um, no one, no humans ever saw cells until the microscope was invented somewhere in the 17th century, 1600s. Cell theory suggests that cells are the building blocks of all plants and animals. So every plant and animal, every living thing that you see is made up of cells. All cells come from pre-existing cells that divide <clears throat> and cells are the smallest units that carry out the functions of cells. Cells maintain homeostasis and cells combine together to allow homeostasis at a higher level. All right, this shows a number of types of cells and it also reinforces what we covered before. And if you look over here, you see different kinds of cells. So here, uh, starting over here, it's showing a sperm fertilizing an egg and then the embryo grows over here and then it differentiates, differentiates to form all the different tissue types that we will learn about. And then you end up with the major groups and um, this is discussed in a later chapter, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nerve tissue. So different cells have different appearances, but for purposes of this book, we mainly look at a sort of a generalized cell, so you're, you're first learning about cells. And then in later chapters, we go into details about specific cells. All right, as I mentioned before, cells vary in structure, but they all come from a single fertilized ovum, meaning a sperm fertilizing an egg, and then they differentiate. <coughs> now, every cell, just about, is surrounded by extracellular fluid. So if this is a cell, and this is another cell, there's usually a space between the cells, at least in many types of uh, tissues and there's fluid that can flow between the cells. So let me change the color here to uh, to show fluid. So this would be the extracellular fluid that's running between the cells. All right, the cells themselves have have um, an outer membrane which we call a plasma or a cell membrane. Inside they have cytoplasm and another separation is that usually in the middle of a cell there's a large round structure called the nucleus. 
So the outer portion is the cytoplasm, the inner portion is called the nucleus, and uh, further looking at the cytoplasm, there are the organelles, and technically the nucleus itself would be an organelle, but since the nucleus is so large and it's in the middle and it's round, we often treat it separately, and also it's very important, so we often treat it separately. All right, so again, we have extracellular fluid, we have cell or plasma membrane, plasma or cell or cytoplasmic membrane, we have the cytoplasm itself, and we have the nucleus, and then in the rest of this video lecture we'll talk about other organelles as well. All right, this diagram not from your book, but um, it, it's good to look at a couple of different diagrams to get an idea of of what cells look like, not just one picture of one cell by one artist in one book. So this is a complicated picture at first glance, but it's showing all the major organelles that we'll be talking about for the next um, half hour or so. <coughs> so one thing you could see is in the middle there's a nucleus in blue. And by the way, this cell is sort of cut in half, almost like a grapefruit sliced in half. Um, so the, the cell would actually be uh, sort of rounded uh, depending on the cell. And we see a number of structures here. We see a flagellum sticking out. We, we saw the nucleus. As we said, the nucleus is surrounded by a double membrane, so we call it a nuclear envelope. And there are a lot of other structures. You can ref go back and refer to this diagram on your own, but we're going to go through each organelle. All right, so some organelles in the in the cell are non-membranous. They do not have a membrane surrounding them. Uh, a membrane, as we'll reinforce in this chapter, a membrane is made up usually of a double layer of phospholipid with proteins in the membrane as well. So these are some examples of organelles that are that don't have a membrane around it and we're going to talk about them individually. And then there are, there are organelles that have membranes, including the nucleus that I just mentioned, and some of the other important organelles. All right, so here are some of the organelles that we just had on the previous lists, and, and here we go into some of their, their functions. In brief, and so we have microvilli. These are extensions of the cell that increase the surface area f for absorption. So if this is the cell, you would have these extensions on the cell that would increase surface area. Whoop, that was a mistake. Anyway, then cytoskeleton. These are fibers or protein strands in the cell that give the cell increased structure, uh, strength and support, and uh, they also mention centrosomes in here, which doesn't necessarily fit, but in any event. So here's another picture of a cell that uh, does not come from our textbook, from a different uh, textbook, and this is, gives you another idea of the cell. Again, you have a flagellum, you have the nucleus, here they've cut away the nucleus to give you some sense of that it's a round ball. Here they've, and also they've cut it away like a grapefruit. And uh, to add a few more structures, so here are the microvilli we just mentioned. And uh, here's the centrosome with its centrioles, these two sort of shiny gold things. And uh, we mentioned the plasma membrane, we mentioned the nucleus before. And these interesting looking things that look like little boats <coughs> or cradles or something or candies, these are the powerhouses of the cell, the mitochondria, and a cell would have many of them, which uh, these mitochondria make ATP. By the way, on the subject of having many, 
these cell diagrams are just sort of illustrations. They're just idealized drawings for purposes of teaching. They don't necessarily represent the, an exact cell. So in fact, a cell might have dozens or hundreds of mitochondria in it. And in fact, there generally wouldn't be any spaces in the cell that you see here would be packed with various organelles. But again, this is for teaching purposes. All right, continuation of a list of some of the major organelles. Ribosomes, as we'll learn, are involved in making, uh, well, it doesn't say, it, in making protein. Ribosomes are themselves made out of RNA and protein, and many of them are, many of these ribosomes, which are very small, are attached to what's called the endoplasmic reticulum which we abbreviate ER. We're going to go come back to all of these things. And some of the ribosomes are found floating freely in the cytoplasm. All right, peroxisomes uh, you can read about on your own. Lysosomes are uh, sometimes called suicide sacs because they have powerful digestive enzymes. To go back to peroxisomes, peroxisomes are somewhat similar. They're both types of vesicles. Vesicles are little round bubbly bubble things. They, they're they not like air bubbles. They're made of membrane. Um, in the case of peroxisomes, they have uh, di also kind of digestive enzymes that break down uh, fats and other organic compounds and destroy toxic materials. <clears throat> All right, moving along in the list of and and brief description of these organelles, and we're going to come back to all of these with diagrams shortly. The Golgi apparatus are stacks of membranes, sort of like pancakes. I mean, this is not the way they look, but imagine several pancakes, and then each layer it serves to do one function. So Golgi are interesting. They store material, they modify or alter material, and they package materials for export. Here are the mitochondria that I mentioned. The mitochondria are where the ATP, the high energy molecule in the cell, is produced. So ATP is necessary for all your energy needs. So not only contracting your muscles, like moving your arms and your legs, but of course your heart pumping, your lungs moving, but also brain activities and digestion and just about every function of the body requires ATP. Moving along, we have the nucleus. The nucleus um, is surrounded by a double membrane, what we call an envelope. And the nucleus is is the storage spot for DNA. So the DNA, the genetic information, see here they just say genetic information, but that information is made out of DNA. And then the DNA carries the instructions on how to make protein. We're going to obviously get back to the nucleus later. Then we have the endoplasmic reticulum that I mentioned, the abbreviated ER, these are sheets. These are sort of membranous sheets. They're hard to draw or hard for me to draw. So they're, imagine, parallel sheets that actually are connected in some way. <coughs> and there would be many of them. Many of them. Anyway, um, what's the role of the ER? Well, it produces, it synthesizes uh, or let me be more exact, the rough ER has ribosomes attached, those little structures I mentioned previously. The ribosomes are actually quite small, so they'll appear on the ER as little dots. And it's the ribosomes that actually where the protein is made, but uh, since the ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, the proteins go inside the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and then are moved along through the membranes to various locations. Again, we'll see a diagram of that. 
And so there are two types of ER. There's the rough ER, rough because it has those ribosomes that make it look bumpy under the electron microscope. Then there's smooth ER. These do not have ribosomes, no ribosomes. And the smooth ER makes lipids and carbohydrates and also detoxifies various materials in the cell. All right, now let's start looking a little more closely at the different organelles. This was actually kind of an overview, although it lasted a while. Um, so now let's look at the, the structures in somewhat more detail, looking at pictures as well. So we have the plasma membrane. This is a membrane that surrounds the cell and also could divide within the cell. And we say that it's selectively permeable. That means it, it serves as a gatekeeper allowing some materials to pass in or out of the cell and other materials not. So some materials can pass in, other materials can pass out, and other, uh, yet other materials may be unable to pass in and other materials may be unable to pass out, and it could change its, its uh, behavior from time to time. All right, these are components of the plasma membrane. This uh, slide has more, maybe more information than we need. So this glycocalyx made of carbohydrates uh, mixed with uh, various other kinds of molecules. Uh, these, this glycocalyx is involved in cell recognition, <coughs> which is very important. In other words, how does one cell in your body recognize other cells? Cells need to un recognize each other. Uh, for example, muscle cells need to know, okay, I'm here with the other muscle cells and not go off and, and find itself in a, in a collection of bone cells. And there are other functions as well uh, that these proteins have. So then there are integral proteins that are part of the cell membrane. Again, we're going to see a diagram of this. And some of the proteins are only on part of the membrane. Other proteins go across the whole membrane. So this is the membrane. So we'll have some proteins that are more on the outside, some proteins more on the inside, and some proteins that go across the whole membrane and have an important role there. All right, so the, these little red things are proteins, and this is the membrane. All right, then there are peripheral proteins which are attached to the surface somehow, and uh, again, we'll, we'll see them as well. All right, so here's the classic uh, diagram that you could stare at for 15 minutes and to try to understand things. So here it shows <coughs> the blue are the proteins. These red things with blue tails are phospholipids. And we'll see an enlarged diagram of one phospholipid in a moment. Um, but you see there are two rows of phospholipids. There's this row, and then there's the second row. And interspersed among the phospholipids is cholesterol. This kind of yellowish, yellow-orange thing is cholesterol. That's part of the membrane. And then you see the blue proteins, and then you see carbohydrates. So these uh, purplish or lavender things are carbohydrates. So you see the uh, arrangement in general here. Let's move on. And this is a slide you can come come back to on your own. The plasma membrane is quite thin. As I said, it has a double phospholipid layer. And here's an enlargement of that double layer. So there are two rows of phospholipids. So each balloon and, and its uh, two blue strings represents one phospholipid molecule. Then there are, pro, there are uh, cholesterol molecules as well. Uh, the purpose of the plasma membrane is uh, multifold. I mean, basically, the plasma membrane is like uh, oh, the wall of a building or the structure of a building that separates the inside from the outside and also has windows and doors that and locks which regulate the, the passage of people, of, of 
objects and also even of, of air, perhaps, you know, ventilation systems in and out <coughs> of the house. In this case, we're talking about, we're talking about a cell and the plasma membrane of the cell. All right, so this is what they mean by physical isolation, exchange with the external environment, sensitivity to the environment. The membrane also gives some structural support because the inside of a cell is, is aside from the organelles, the, the space between the organelles is mostly like a, a jelly material. It's basically w largely water. And the lipid bilayer here provides isolation. It kind of blocks a lot of things. And proteins serve mostly as the windows and doors that let things and in and out that control various substances. All right, so here is a rundown in two slides of various types of membrane proteins. They actually showed them on that uh, previous transparency and you can refer back to them on your own. In fact, uh, I'll go back in a second and look at them. So there are anchoring proteins <clears throat> that attach the plasma membrane to other structures. Because remember, cells in your body are not living by themselves. They're, they're interacting and they're attached to other cells. Then there are recognition pro proteins. These are kind of the ID cards. So... In order to maintain order in the body and to keep out infection, there are immune system cells which roam around, white blood cells of various types that roam around looking for infectious particles and destroying them. So those immune cells have to have a way to recognize friend from foe. So all the cells in your body have the proper ID card to say, hey, you know, I belong here. All right, then there are receptor proteins that will attach to to things coming into the cell. So if, if here's a cell <coughs> and the cell wants to attract something, in this case they mentioned calcium, you could have a protein that is attractive and will bind to calcium and then uh, allow the calcium to go into the cell. And then to continue the list, there are carrier proteins that, that carry various substances into or out of the cell. So these are helper proteins that the product could not go in or out of the cell on its own. It's helped along by the carrier protein. And then there are channels, which sound similar to carrier proteins, but they're not quite the same thing, which allow materials to pass on, on their own. So those would be like windows and, and doors that allow materials to get in or out of the cell. So let's see if we could quickly find this on the on the diagram. So this would be this would be a, a carrier protein that that helps things get into the cell or out of the cell. This would be a channel that serves as a clear window or doorway. Um, this might be a so some sort of identification um, protein, and it's sometimes hard to tell from the artist. This might be an identifying protein because it's linked to a carbohydrate. So the immune cell might come over and say, oh, okay, this and this means that it belongs in the body. All right. Let's go forward again. And now we get to the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is sort of the framework for the cell. The cytoskeleton is made of various protein uh, strands. And the word skeleton doesn't mean that it has bones in it. Remember, this is just one microscopic cell <coughs> But as I said, the cell is made of jelly-like material, and so you need some sort of shaping molecule. The, the cell, the plasma membrane provides some of that, but then you also have other fibers or filaments within the cell. So these, from small to large, these include microfilaments, which are found on the sort of near the outside of the cell, 
and they're located within microvilli, which we came across in the previous cell. Um, but I'll mention it again, those things that increase the surface area. So inside these microvilli, there would be some microfilaments to give it um, some body. Microfilaments are also found what's called the terminal web. And they're intermediate filaments. And then uh, microtubules are the largest of these protein filaments. And uh, these are involved in a number of processes, most, in, perhaps most importantly in cell division, we'll come across microtubules again. So here's a picture of some of these structures in the cytoskeleton, the microvilli over here with their, uh, their microfilaments inside. And then here's the terminal web. On the left, you see a diagrammatic view. And on the right, this is actually a photograph, an electron microscopic photograph, 30,000 30, magnification. Then intermediate filaments, and then the larger microtubules. So all of these together provide sort of hooks or, or attachment points for the different organelles. So the organelles are not necessarily floating within the cell free form, although the organelles and structures in the cell can move around. All right, so speaking of, of uh, protein strands, centrioles are structures made of microtubules. There are, there are starting out two within each cell. And um, And they're found within an area of the cell called the centrosome. And centriol is a little mysterious. It's not quite clear of their exact role. They seem to play some part in, in generating the extensions of the cell, which, which are called cilia and flagella. <coughs> and they seem to play a role, or may play a role, in cell division, in mitosis. All right, so here they're mentioning cell division, that they're involved in, in the cell division process. We'll uh, come across them again in a later video when we talk about cell division. So this is actually a picture of two centrioles, one here and one here. To me, they look a little bit like those little red licorice bits. And in this picture, you can see the two of them over here near the nucleus. When a cell is not dividing, there are two in this area and then when the cell divides, actually the centrioles divide, so you get four centrioles, at least for a short time. All right, your textbook, for some strange reason, doesn't have a picture in uh, the cell chapter of a flagellum. It, it would in the reproduction chapter later in, in the book, which we discuss in Bio 240. But... But this is a, the picture on the right from another textbook shows sperm cells and this long thread thing is its tail or flagellum which allows the sperm to swim through liquid and then find the egg and fertilize it. And then over here we see uh, a cell that might have cilia. cilia. Cells would not have both cilia and flagella. They'd have only cilia or only one flagellum. Cilia, there would be many of them in a cell. And this is actually a photograph uh, by, in a light microscope showing, no, no actually it's a, it's a, it's a low-power electron microscope image showing the cilia which look sort of like grass. Okay, so uh, the reason we're showing cilia and flagella here is because both cilia and flagella have essentially the same structure. Cilia are, are shorter and flagella are longer, longer, but both are made up inside of many microtubules. So they're showing the microtubules over here. Each of those circles represents one microtubule. And they're showing uh, here how the micro, uh, how the cilia work. They beat, <laughs> and the flagellum similarly would beat like that. So you have uh, cells with cilia that line your breathing tract, 
And these cilia are constantly beating and then going back and beating again, back and forth. And the goal there is to push mucus with trapped dirt up and out of your respiratory tract. All right, here's a discussion of ribosomes. So ribosomes, we said, were involved in protein synthesis. There are two parts of the ribosome uh, that come together before protein synthesis occurs. Most ribosomes are found attached to the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, we showed the endoplasmic reticulum with all these little dots which were the ribosomes. But some ribosomes are found floating around freely. So that we call them free ribosomes. The other ones the other ones we would we would call uh, attached ribosomes. The ones that are attached to the ER. Okay, the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. And as I mentioned earlier, the ribosomes themselves are, are made out of protein and a molecule called RNA. And since it's in the ribosome, we call it ribosomal RNA, and we can abbreviate ribosomal RNA as R RNA. We've learned about RNA in, and DNA in Chapter 2, and we'll... Uh, become reacquainted with it here in Chapter 3. So this is what a ribosome looks like in two parts. It looks a little like a, to my mind, like a Smurf, maybe just because of the blue. And uh, so here is a description of the ER that we keep talking about. So the ER is the endoplasmic reticulum. It's a network of, of membranes. And within the membranes, there are sort of tubes or, or, or passageways. And um, there are two types of ER. There's a smooth ER that does not have ribosomes attached, and the smooth ER has its own specific functions, which we'll come to in, a, in one of the next slides. And the rough ER has attached or fixed ribosomes. And as we said, the ribosomes attached to the rough ER is, is where most of the protein in the body is made and most of the protein cell. So here we finally have a detailed picture of all of this. <coughs> so over here we have the, the, the smooth ER, smooth ER, and these look like little branching pipes or coral. And so the, as we said, um, Lipids and carbohydrates are manufactured here. Materials are detoxified. But protein activity, protein formation, occurs in the, the, the rough ER. And for some reason, they don't label the rough ER over here, R-E-R. -E they do later on, I think. So here's the nucleus. And by the way, in the middle of the nucleus is often a nucleolus, a smaller structure. So here are all the ER, and you can see that the ER has a double membrane, so materials can move along this inner membrane. What happens is the ribosomes make protein and then in, sort of inject it into the central, that central passageway, and then the protein can move around or then get pinched off and go to a, what we call a Golgi body. All right, so bottom line here, take home point, is the endoplasmic reticulum is made up of smooth ER and rough ER, and this is something of what they look like. So now we uh, have a slide which lists some of the functions of the smooth ER in more detail. Um, basically, you need to know my brief description in the lecture outline, which which uh, talks about how lipids are synthesized here, lipids of various type, and um, and carbohydrates also. And so here they mention glycogen. So glycogen is a polysaccharide. It, it is a carbohydrate. And then up here, 
with respect to lipids, phospholipid, cholesterol, steroid hormones, glycerides, all of these are in the lipid family. So that's the main take-home point you need to know about this, about the smoothie arm. And here's a summary of this, which basically says what I just said. And here is the rough ER that I promised you they would have a nice diagram of, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. <coughs> As you see, it's stacks of, of flattened double membranes. And on the membranes, there are these ribosomes, the little dots. And down here, and notice that all the membranes are connected. They're connected to each other, and they're also connected to the nucleus at some point or another. And then within, if you enlarge an area of one uh, membrane of endoplasmic reticulum, they're, they're showing you in the bottom more or less how the process works um, of protein formation. So here is... So here is a ribosome, and coming to the ribosome is something called an RNA called messenger, mRNA, messenger. In a later video lecture, we're going to go into this in great detail, messenger RNA. And this RNA, that green worm, sort of slides by along the ribosome, and that RNA carries the instructions of how to assemble a protein. Remember, protein is made up of amino acids. And these little um, beads or pearls represent the growing polypeptide, that is, chain of amino acids. Each little bead represents one amino acid in this picture. So then we see this is the step one. I mean, it's just roughly speaking, step two, and then step three. So once the full protein is formed, which might take uh, a full protein or polypeptide might be 50 or 75 or 150 or 200 amino acids long, <coughs> once the protein is completed, from the instructions on the mRNA, the completed protein breaks away from the ribosome. The ribosome here is showing going off. The protein goes off on its own. And then the protein would be pinched off inside a vesicle. So this is a vesicle, this little bubble thing here. And I keep saying bubble, but it's it's made out of that same or a membrane similar to the plasma membrane with phospholipid and protein. And so these transport vesicles actually transport the proteins inside to somewhere. And that somewhere is that's that somewhere is usually the the Golgi, what's called the Golgi apparatus named after a scientist whose name was Golgi. Anyway, so the function of the ER is repeated here, and uh, transport vesicles, I already talked about this, and here comes the Golgi that I just mentioned. So, so that little vesicle would come and then attach to the Golgi membrane. So we're going to see a diagram of Golgi in a minute, and also those cell pictures we saw at the beginning of this video lecture also show the Golgi. I just didn't point them out. So the Golgi apparatus <coughs> uh, helps renew or modify the plasma membrane. So things are not stationary in the cell. Uh, as you see, vesicles can break off from the ER and then go to the Golgi. Uh, Vesicles can break off from the Golgi and go to the cell membrane, can go from the cell membrane and go back to uh, the ER or the Golgi or to the nucleus. All sorts of movements are possible. So the Golgi, besides uh, renewing or modifying the cell membrane, also modifies or packages secretions for release by the cell. Later in 
in the chapter and in another video lecture, we'll talk about exocytosis, removing things from the cell. Every time you see exocytosis, you should think of exit. You know, like this exit sign, so that's how to get out. So exo is exit, cyto is the cell, how to get out of the cell, getting out of the cell. All right, the Golgi, as we've said, the Golgi modifies materials for export and um, packages materials in, in vesicles of various sorts, as, as we've said. Uh, the Golgi consists, as I said earlier, of sort of s several pancake-like structures. These are each one is called a cisterna and plural cisternae. We will get a picture soon of this. And um, um, basically what this says is that the steps of the function <coughs> is that products from the rough ER <coughs> come to one side of the Golgi. So if this is the rough ER over here, some vesicle leaves the rough ER, or vesicles leave the rough ER, and then they go to the to the Golgi. So the Golgi might be shaped something like this. So here's one layer, here's another layer. There are more layers, usually like three to five. And then the vesicle goes and attaches to one side of the Golgi, which is the the forming phase, and then is the material in the in the vesicle is processed. <clears throat> then another vesicle forms, which goes to the second cisterna, and more is done. And then the vesicle continues, maybe to the third or fourth. Each time, <clears throat> a like an assembly line. Each time, one more thing being done, and then eventually the the vesicle is released at what's called the maturing phase at the other side. <laughs> All right, so here it mentions some of the products of the Golgi apparatus, and secretory vesicles which release things, enzymes. Uh, we mentioned that before. Also lysosomes. Lysosomes are um, contain very powerful digestive enzymes and they may be used in uh, destroying organelles that are old or sometimes in destroying a cell that needs to be destroyed. And this is a picture showing the whole process that we've discussed. So the Golgi is down in here and these are the various cisternae and then you could see vesicles going from one cisterna to another. So here it's going from here to here, and then it's attaching over here and releasing its contents into the this cisterna, and then the product will go to the next one and the next one. <coughs> All right, so here you could see the a, a final vesicle leaving with its product, the green stuff, whatever is in it. Here they're saying it's a, a lysosome as an example. And the lysosome contains digestive enzymes. And then the lysosome um, might combine with something coming in. So this could be some solid material, food, or it could be a bacterium that needs to be destroyed and that will merge with the lysosome which will digest it and release, perhaps release the contents by exocytosis. So there are different ways in which things can occur, but in general the process goes from uh, the ER to the Golgi to form lysosomes, peroxisomes, various secretory products, and then release from the cell. All right, now let's move on to the last major organelle that we look at in this video lecture, 
uh, we'll look at the nucleus in a different, the next video lecture. <coughs> but in this last organelle is an important one that I mentioned before, the mitochondria. That's plural, since there are usually many mitochondria. If we were just talking about one, we would say mitochondrion. And of course, the mitochondria produce energy in the form of ATP. So they burn up sugar in the presence of oxygen and uh, release huge amounts of ATP that are needed by every cell in, in your body. Well, they mentioned red cells have none, but uh, for example, cardiac muscle cells are, you don't have to know this figure, but maybe a third of, of the muscle cell, the cardiac muscle cell is made up of mitochondria. So here's a diagram. This looks complex. It's actually a simplified diagram of uh, of the uh, activity in the in the mitochondria. Um, even though it's simplified, we don't have to know too much detail. So here it shows that in the cytoplasm, sugar glucose is broken down. It, essentially, it's broken in half into two molecules called pyruvate. This process does not need oxygen. It's, it, it's called glycolysis. It's, it takes place without oxygen. It's called an anaerobic process. And then the pyruvate goes into the mitochondria <coughs> and then various complicated steps take place which are discussed in a much later chapter that is covered perhaps in Bio 240, and then various energetic steps occur, and in those steps the pyruvate is, is um, essentially oxidized, and then that energy is used to attach or reattach phosphate to a molecule called ADP, adenosine diphosphate, which is lacking one phosphate group in order to be the high energy form. And then the product that's released from the mitochondrion from the attachment of ADP and phosphate, the product is ATP, which basically is ADP plus just the third phosphate added. So if you take ADP and add one phosphate group, you'll have to look in the book and uh, to see this, I think it's discussed in, in chapter 2 at the end, but if you attach just that third phosphate group to ADP, it, it is now the high energy ATP molecule which leaves the mitochondrion and is used within the cell. So that's largely what we need to know and uh, just to reemphasize, the first process in the cytoplasm takes place anaerobically without oxygen, but inside the mitochondrion we need oxygen, O2. <coughs> right? And the waste products that are released include water, which can be reused by the cell, and CO2, which is a poisonous gas, or in large quantities is poisonous, that needs to be removed from the body. So in fact our breathing mechanism you know, just the fact that we breathe and we know we need to breathe to stay alive is because the mitochondria need oxygen to burn up the sugar or the breakdown product of sugar and we so we need to take in oxygen and we breathe out because we need to get rid of all that CO2 that is the waste product that the mitochondria are releasing. So all our breathing actions is due to the requirements of the mitochondria in our cells, not because of any sort of mystical reason why we need to breathe. All right, so this, the next few slides go into some detail. I've mostly described, uh, you know, what you need to know. This talks about the structure of the mitochondria and um, the membranes, the characteristic lines in the mitochondria are, are called Christi, and that's where the enzymes are found. So here you could see uh, this is a beautiful electron micrograph. 
this is false color, they've added the color to highlight what the mitochondria, you know, so you can easily see that the red thing, red and yellow, is the mitochondrion, and outside are other parts of the cell, uh, including most likely these are endoplasmic reticula with, with ribosomes attached. Uh, but in any case, here you can see the Christi, these, these double membranes where the <coughs> enzymes that carry out this <coughs> reaction are, are located. And uh, this describes the steps, the same steps I described. That first one, the anaerobic step, was is called glycolysis. And then once inside the mitochondria, there are a couple of steps which are listed here. Step two, step three. So ATP is formed from ADP. The ATP leaves the mitochondria. And, um, and and that's about it. Again, just the highlights. Look in the lecture outline as well to have an overview of that. But it's not something I heavily emphasize. I understand that it's a difficult topic for many students. And that ends our our lecture on this first part of the cell. So there are two more parts. The second part is on the nucleus and what goes on uh, with the DNA and the instructions and formation of protein. And then the third, the third uh, video lecture covers the last part of the chapter, membrane uh, transport, things like diffusion osmosis, and also the cell cycle, which would be mitosis. Okay, 